everybody. So welcome to part three of my three-part lecture on the Phaedo. So we begin this part with Socrates getting two different objections from his interlocutors, Simeas and Cebes. And they take turns offering their objection before Socrates gets to respond. And these objections are important because we might find them kind of plausible. And Socrates has to kind of work hard to reply to them. We might wonder whether he's successful. So the first of these objections comes from Simeas, who asks, how can we be sure that the soul, as you say, is a thing that's separate from the body, right? So a lot of your arguments seem to require that the soul is separate from the body, but how can we be sure that that is the case? So think of the following analogy that he offers. He says, think of a lyre. All right, a lyre is an ancient Greek instrument. So this is an image of the god Apollo at a temple to him holding a, a lyre made out of a tortoise shell and some strings. So Apollo is playing the lyre, right? And if he's playing the lyre correctly, as he would, because he's a god, you would get harmonious sound. So Simeas asks, isn't the soul in relation to the body more like what harmony is to the lyre? So the harmony that comes out of a lyre is something that kind of the lyre is doing. It's not a separate object that can be separated from the lyre. It's something that comes about because of the action of the lyre. So why not think that maybe the soul is like that with respect to the body? The soul, this living thing, the psuche, is a result of, say, the particular arrangement and activity of the body at a particular time. If we think this is analogy is correct, then it would turn out that the soul disappears when we die, as opposed to continues to exist eternally. It wouldn't be able to be disentangled from the body because it can't exist without the body. So harmony can't exist without a liar. If we think that this is a good analogy for the soul's relationship to the body, then, then the soul can't exist without a body either. This is Simeas. So he says, harmony is something invisible, without body, beautiful and divine in the attuned liar. Whereas the lyre itself and its strings are physical, bodily, composite, earthy, and akin to what is mortal. So he's here kind of taking bits of the affinity argument. He's saying, look, harmony is like these eternal, immutable, invisible forms in the ways that you were saying the soul is, and the lyre is material in the way that you were saying material things are. But we don't think that just because of that, the harmony continues to exist if the lyre is destroyed. So if the soul is a kind of harmony or attunement of the body, isn't it destroyed when the body is? It's a very good objection. Before we can get to the reply to this objection, um, Socrates compels Cebes to give his own objection. And then he goes on and, and replies to that. So let's, let's talk about Cebes' objection. Cebes says, why should we think that the soul is truly immortal and that it'll exist after death? How do we know that the soul maybe is like long lasting, but will wear out after outliving one body? For example, um, he says, think of a man who's wearing a cloak. Like suppose this cloak is like really well made. It's a very high quality cloak. We can ask, does the man last longer than the cloak he wears? He may wear many cloaks and eventually, however, he will wear his last cloak, right? So we can think, Look, there's this disanalogy. Something can be long-lived without that necessarily meaning that it is immortal. So what if the soul is like that? The soul is like the original example of the man wearing a cloak, and it goes through a bunch of bodies, like, like pieces of clothing, and eventually it reaches its last body. It just wears out, like the man at a certain point, he dies. So what do you have to say to this, Socrates? Now, one important thing that happens next uh, in this little interlude in the dialogue is that Socrates acknowledges that these objections are really good and really hard, and he wants to take them seriously. And so he has this little kind of encouraging thing that he says in the middle of the dialogue. All right, we know this is going to be hard. However, we shouldn't give up reasoning and argumentation just because they're difficult. We should put truth above everything, he says. You shouldn't hate logic just because it's hard. He says, look, I might maybe die before we figure this out. <laughs> Remember, he's like imminently about to have to take a cup of hemlock. This is sort of hanging over everyone's heads this whole time. But he says, 
But if I die mistaken, then my folly will die with me. But I'd rather be tested to say the truth before I die. So don't be afraid about these objections. Don't be afraid that you're going to trap me in a corner. I still believe in logic. He has this moving thing that he says at the end of this passage. If you will take my advice, you will give but little thought to Socrates, but much more to the truth. If you think that what I say is true, agree with me. If not, oppose it with every argument and take care that in my eagerness, I do not deceive myself and you, and like a bee, leave my sting in you when you go. So he's like, look, if there's one legacy I wanna leave, it's the legacy of caring about the truth. So don't be worried that maybe you're offending me before I die by giving me these arguments and maybe I won't be successful in replying, but it's still worth a try. Really cool, noble thing to say and we philosophers and uh, logicians and mathematicians and people like that sometimes go like, yeah, you go, man. Like, don't you care about being wrong? What's important is trying to work at it, right? <laughs> All right. So after this interlude, which occurs page 91 in the original Stephanus notation, we move on to replying to the harmony and the lyre objection that Simeus gave us earlier. So what does Socrates have to say to the harmony and the lyre argument? It's a pretty good argument. And we have to ask ourselves whether this reply is good enough. So I want you to think about how adequate you think this reply is, and maybe mention something in our discussion when we talk about um, the Phaedo together. So Socrates says, basically, look, if you accept the recollection argument that I gave earlier, which they were all very emphatic in accepting, and you know, they, they sort of, there's this background that we have of the Mino, he's given this argument before, it seems really compelling. How do you explain a priori knowledge, like knowledge that we have of mathematics, things that we can't learn about through sense experience, our knowledge of the equal, unless it's possible that we know things from before we were born, right? That's the recollection argument. If you accept that argument, which Simeus and Cebes both seem to have done, then you can't, he says, accept the harmony is to the soul as the liar is to the body argument. Why? Well, that's because as you yourself said, Simeus, harmony doesn't pre-exist in the liar. Like before the liar exists, there can be no harmony. At least no, you know, none of the harmony that is produced by the kind of thing that is a liar. So Orpheus's harmonic liar playing can't possibly pre-exist either Orpheus or the liar. Whereas the recollection argument established that our souls must have been alive before we were born. So notice that this kind of reply doesn't require that the soul is eternal. It doesn't go that far, but it does seem to require that we accept the tenets of the recollection argument. And there's not a lot said further against the recollection argument. So that might be one place to poke at this argument. But Socrates has another thing to say in reply to Simeus's objection here. He also says, there's a further reason that a soul can't be a harmony of the body. It can't be something that the body does or produces that's not a separate substance. Because the soul, in fact, rules over, he says, the affectations of the body. <laughs> so the idea is like, look, the harmony doesn't control the liar. In the case of Orpheus here, Orpheus controls the liar. Orpheus controls the harmony, right? Um, the liar itself rules over what harmonious sounds can come out of it. And Orpheus, as, as the, the liar player in particular, can control the harmonious sounds that come out of the lyre. But the, the, the soul and the body's relationship, Socrates says, is disanalogous to the example you gave. The soul is actually what tells your body what to do. This is um, what we could call a psychological theory. So suppose that I am hungry, right? <laughs> I'm hungry and I'm giving a lecture, um, like it's happening right now. I'm actually a little bit peckish. I could use a snack but I'm working on something. And if I leave, it'll take me a long time to come back and then it'll be dark outside and then I won't finish the video, right? So there's something that I want to do that my body wants me to do, but my soul, that is my mind, right? Can have authority over my body up to a point. But the idea is my soul being rational, my soul being rational decides what my body does. It is my, my mind, my psyche, my soul, that makes an action plan for me. So right now, I might be hungry, but I am deciding to do my work. And because I'm deciding to do my work, 
my body isn't about to automatically get up and run over to like the nearest open cafe if there is one left, right? It's going to sit here and wait until it's dinner time because I've decided. Now, this is not something that is possible for harmony. Harmony being something that results out of the action of the liar, harmony can't control the liar. Orpheus, on the other hand, Orpheus over here can control it. So the idea is your, your analogy doesn't work, Simeas, because it's missing some crucial features, right? So insofar as your analogy is disanalogous, it doesn't let us get this conclusion from the argument by analogy. And that's Socrates' reply. You might think, it, and I've suggested already, that it's a little bit disappointing, but I want to leave it as an exercise to the reader. What premise in this argument, what, what assumption in this argument is, is the one, or is there more than one, that is suspicious? and that we should resist. Because Simeon's idea is pretty cool. And we do nowadays think that the mind is nothing more than what the brain does. The mind isn't a floating ectoplasm, <laughs> right? They have no extension or something like that on this Cartesian picture. It's not a platonic soul. It's just something that, that the body does. And later on, we'll also see this as a theory that Aristotle seems to like. He has some, like this view that Simia suggests about the soul, that it is something that is done by the body. So what, what is happening when this objection goes wrong? And what, in what ways is Socrates' reply lacking? Okay, so now Socrates has to respond to the man and cloak objection that we get from Cebes. And this is a good objection. Why should we think that the soul lasts forever as opposed to just a very long time, right? Maybe a little bit before we were alive, but maybe a limited number of total lives. Why, why won't it wear down? Socrates' response to this objection is a little bit complicated. I'm gonna to try to simplify it. So I'm not gonna necessarily go in the order of the text as I explain it. It might be worth your while to reread that passage if that's something you're interested in because he makes uh, reference to some pre-Socratic philosophers. But Socrates, in order to, to respond to Cebes, needs to basically go over the metaphysics of forms yet again. So forms are really central to the Phaedo. And maybe the best way to frame how the forms are important is to think about how he has to show that the forms are both really real and that they are genuine causes of things, but also how are the forms, which are invisible and in this different realm, how do they exist relative to specific particulars, like this cup or my body or this jug or whatever? Um, how do the forms exist relative to this material world we are in here? And Socrates goes back to this point he made in his reply to Simeus. It is the mind, the soul, the sort of nous, and the psyche, the suche, that are the real causes of actions. And he gives us an example kind of in a grumpy way. Look, if it weren't the case that my mind is responsible for why I am here right now, if it were my bones and sinew deciding where I was gonna be, then I would be halfway to Megara by now. I wouldn't be sitting in this cell waiting to die. So it must be that the mind is the genuine cause of, of me being here, not my bones and sinew. So by implication, it's not bodies, it's not material objects that are the genuine causes of things, although they might to a naive non-philosophical person appear to be, but it is these abstract idea things like the soul that are the genuine causes of things. So what we need to find is what are the realest of the real objects that are genuinely the causes of things happening? And we get into a discussion of opposites that in some way contradicts what happened earlier in the dialogue that we discussed earlier in the lecture, that opposites come from opposites. This is an intuition that Plato in this text wants to keep and that Socrates is careful with, but he modifies significantly. So what are the realist causes? The answer is gonna be the forms are the realist causes, but why should we believe in the forms? Why should we think that it's possible to have a theory of forms? <laughs> this is kind of the central question for Plato, right? Like why, why is this kooky metaphysical idea something we should take seriously? Well, one reason, and this is kind of the reason given throughout this part of the dialogue, is that if you don't assume this particular theory of the forms like Plato wants to assume it, then you get contradictions and specifically contradictions and opposites. So let's talk about life and death again. 
did you remember feeling like, what do you mean opposites come from opposites? Like, wouldn't that require that something be completely transformed in a way that's not natural to it? It requires that there be the singular object that is separate from the things that are causing it, that moves it from its opposites. Like how can big be the thing that causes small? That just already doesn't make sense. I didn't even bring up this objection earlier, but this is something that's sort of there, kind of in the background. How can it be possible that life comes from death? Like if they are truly opposites, this should be impossible. How can something that in its essence rejects the essence of the other thing, somehow that produces the other thing. This seems to go completely against the Parmenidean theory that what is cannot come from what is not. And Socrates here, this Socrates in the Phaedo, turns to relying on this sort of notion. So the, the, the resolution to this dilemma is supposed to be the forms. So the forms are perfections of, of properties, you can think. There is, at least in this dialogue, the form of the big, so bigness. Bigness is what makes things be larger. Also, numerosity is the thing that makes things be more. <laughs> and then presumably smallness is the thing that makes things smaller. And why is this a solution? It sounds just as kooky and crazy as the contradictory thing at first. Well, it's a solution in that it separates out these conceptual things, bigness, smallness, numerosity, from particular objects that carry them as properties. You've got a particular object. Oh, this is a piece of paper. This piece of paper is one, but it's, it's also not. It can also divide it and make it two. One can become two. So now I have two of something from one of something, but I can also then further divide it. Now I have two of a thing that was one before, right? So like this is both one thing that I've torn, but also it's two things and also it's four things. So the same thing can be more of something and less of something. And that just doesn't make sense. It wouldn't make sense if all of those opposite qualities adhered in the object in their full and complete sense, right? The way that we can make sense of this set of contradictions is that two isn't something that this piece of paper is necessarily essentially. Two is a property that it gets from this two-ness or something like that. Maybe an easier example that's given in the dialogue is the example of snow. Okay, so snow is cold. But coldness and snow are not identical. Coldness is, in this purpose, is, is a form. It's an idea, it's a concept that applies to snow. Snow partakes in cold, but it's not identical to cold. At the same time, if heat were to approach snow, if something hot were to approach snow, like fire, it would cause the destruction of snow. But coldness hasn't changed. So the coldness in the snow has changed. If the snow loses its coldness, it stops being snow. But coldness continues to exist out here somewhere. And so the genuine causes of the, the creation, the generation and the destruction of the snow are these properties of hotness and coldness. And hotness and coldness exist sort of separately from the material objects like snow and fire that might have coldness or hotness as a property in them. And this is supposed to resolve some confusing contradictory stuff. Like it turns out on Plato's theory here, if it is truly Plato's theory, then that coldness, the form out there, the ideal thing, coldness, can never partake in hotness. So the opposites are true opposites they can never participate in the opposite. The things that participate in the opposites are the particular objects, the particular material objects that we see around us. So this object, for example, and this object, for example, partake of numerous of these ideals, universals of these forms, maybe in different quantities, maybe sometimes opposites inhere in them in some, in some way, they partake of these of these characteristics, these qualities, these forms. But the forms then are the true causes of generation and destruction. This is 
Plato's metaphysical theory of how things come to be and cease to be. An important, maybe quick aside is there are some <laughs> obvious immediate problems for this theory beyond the kooky metaphysics, which is that in a different dialogue, in Plato's Parmenides, Plato portrays Socrates as kind of trying to deal with the inherent contradictions of the theory of forms. So for example, uh, Plato has Parmenides ask Socrates, is there a form of the ugly? Is there a form of mud? Like, is there a form of everything that could potentially have an opposite? And Socrates sort of, oh, no, that, that, would, that, the, that would be horrible. The forms are perfect. There can't be a form of the ugly, but he is very much committed to there being a form of the beautiful. But then if you need forms as opposites in order for causation to be explained, then how does that work? So, so clearly Plato is, is not quite done talking about forms. He's not, he's not totally satisfied with this theory. And we see even in the Phaedo, some characters kind of remark that they're not, they're not entirely comfortable with where this is ending up, but they're, they're willing to go along with it because of course Socrates is about to die. Now we turn again to the soul. <laughs> Remember this whole thing started because we're trying to respond to CBZ's objection. Why should we think the soul is eternal as opposed to just long lived? And Plato's or Socrates' response here is when we think about the soul, the soul has certain characteristics that it has essentially. For example, it has the characteristic of being alive, essentially. Anything that has a soul is of necessity alive. So soul is always carrying with it life, just like snow is always carrying with it coldness. If snow were to stop being cold, the thought goes, it would stop being snow, it would be destroyed. So life, if it partook of death, it would be destroyed. But if that's true, if soul kind of essentially participates in life, then it can't admit of death right? Because death is kind of the opposite that would destroy it. So soul being essentially deathless is, is indestructible and it's eternal. And this is supposed to bring us back to the solution to the cloak problem. If you really take seriously this causal theory where forms are the reasons behind things having their properties and changing the explanation for transformations in the universe, then you have to accept that it is very possible for the soul to have these qualities of eternity. At the beginning of this part of the, the dialogue, Socrates says, I assume the existence of a beautiful, capital B, itself by itself, a good and a great, and all the rest. So they're not capitalized in the Greek, but they're capitalized in the English because they, they are the names of the forms, the good and a great. If you grant me these and agree that they exist, I hope to show you the cause as a result and to find the soul to be immortal. So the forms are the causes of everything. If the soul has as its essential associated form life, then it can't die. And so the cloak analogy doesn't work. The soul is gonna move through dozens and dozens and dozens of bodies and outlive all of them. So now we come to the final part of the dialogue. Socrates takes himself to have proven that the soul is immortal. And um, to show his interlocutors why he shouldn't be afraid of death. And now it is pretty much time for, for Socrates to die. So these last few passages are about some recommendations for the philosopher for things to worry about, things that one should care about, and also some maybe platonic theories of what the afterlife is like, what the cosmos is like. Should we be able to leave the earth and look over above the heavens, above the visible part of the, of the spheres. I won't talk about the cosmology, although I find it really interesting. Students wanting to learn more about platonic cosmology should, should pull out the Timaeus, which is a, um, a platonic work that's all about kind of the cosmos and the earth and, and the structure of the earth. And it's been very influential to medieval Christianity. All of these platonic dialogues have been very influential, but but these particular passages with the afterlife and the structure of the earth and the heavens um, have been particularly influential. So we find ourselves back in, in Socrates' cell, sort of after we spent some time floating around thinking about philosophical topics. And Socrates has for us a bit of advice. He says, if the soul is immortal, it requires our care, not only for the time that we call our life, 
but for the sake of all time. And one is in terrible danger if one does not give it that care. So one of Plato's major preoccupations throughout his works is the idea that whether we are good matters. And one of his supports for this theory here in the Phaedo is that because we should expect that we'll be living past our human lifespan, our material lifespan, it matters a lot more that we care about being good because it will determine what happens to us both in the afterlife and maybe in the future, should we go on to inhabit another body and reincarnate, say, that's sort of left as a possibility. He says, the soul goes to the underworld, possessing nothing but its education and its upbringing. So the idea is when you go to the underworld, you don't take your material body. This is a theme that you've probably heard from some local religions, right? Um, you don't get to take your stuff. You don't get to take your money. You don't get to take your, your books or, you know, you only get whatever is in here, whatever is in your soul, whatever is in this bit that lives on your character and, and your learning, your knowledge, your, your preparedness. And so if we're good, then we should love wisdom. We should be philosophers and we should work our whole lives to try to gain as much as possible during our life that will help us attain a better result in the afterlife. And Socrates gives us some of his theory of what happens in the afterlife, which I won't go over, uh, but the idea is maybe good people get some reward. Do you see here also some of the precursors of like later Christian thought uh, when they mix with, with uh, early Judaic philosophy um, really come from this Platonic and uh, then Aristotelian as well influences. They're really clearly pulled from some of these ideas, not only, but, but some of them. It is right to think then, gentlemen, says Socrates, that if the soul is immortal, it requires our care not only for the time that we call our life, but for the sake of all time, and that one is in terrible danger if one does not give it that care. If death were to escape from everything, it would be a great boon to the wicked to get rid of the body and of their wickedness together with their soul. But now that the soul appears to be immortal, there is no escape from evil or salvation for it except by becoming as good and wise as possible. For the soul goes on to the underworld, possessing nothing but its education and upbringing, which are said to bring the greatest benefit or harm to the dead right at the beginning of the journey yonder. All right, so I'm going to fast forward to the end of the dialogue and read it through with you because I think it's a really beautiful part of the dialogue and it, and it always makes, leaves me a little sad. So Socrates is sitting here in his final moments and he has reached for the cup. He says a final prayer and then it says, this is in 117c. And while he was saying this prayer, he was holding the cup and then drained it calmly and easily. Most of us had been able to hold back our tears reasonably well until then. But when we saw him drinking it, and after he drank it, we could hold them back no longer. My own tears came in floods against my will. So I covered my face. Um, this is Fido, I think, talking. I was weeping for myself, not for him, for my misfortune in being deprived of such a comrade. Even before me, Crito was unable to restrain his tears and got up. Apollodorus had not ceased from weeping before, and at this moment his noisy tears and anger made everybody present break down. What is this, he said, you strange fellows. It is mainly for this reason that I sent the women away. So remember, this is recalling the first part of my lecture where I talked about Xanthope being kicked out of the room. I sent the women away to avoid such unseemliness, for I am told one should die in good ornamented silence. So keep quiet and control yourselves. His words made us ashamed and we checked our tears. So after this, um, Socrates uh, goes on to walk around and when his legs get heavy, he lays down and sort of starts to lose feeling in his body. And he asks Crito to pay, pay back someone he owes. He says, he, we owe a, a cock that is, uh, a rooster to Asclepius, who is the god of healing. Make this offering to him and do not forget. Crito says, it shall be done. Tell us if there's anything else. But there was no answer. Shortly afterwards, Socrates made a movement. The man uncovered him and his eyes were fixed. Seeing this, Crito closed his mouth and his eyes. 
Such was the end of our comrade, a man who, we would say, was all of those we have known the best, and also the wisest, and the most upright. So in this very sad moment, um, his friends are left mourning him, but Socrates has chastised them because he thinks if they have truly understood the message of this dialogue, they should not be sad for him. If they think that he's a good person and that he spent his whole life doing just what he says, trying to make his soul better, then he is off to a better place and someplace he'll be able to talk with maybe Homer, Hesiod, these, these like brilliant poets, maybe the pre-Socratic philosophers who maybe he's been dying to talk to. And uh, even though the dialogue ends very sadly with the death of Socrates, we are meant to feel like there is some hope. A lot of questions still left, naturally. We wonder how many of these arguments are successful, um, but still a very lovely dialogue nonetheless. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next week.